To be honest, I do these uh, interviews, these uh, bit noise talks, because uh, I'm simply curious person, and I use every opportunity to talk to interesting people and you know to share points of view, and that's that's the, the main reason to do it. <laughs> you, you you must miss uh, networking a great deal then, because I mean that was what the whole point of networking was. Sometimes I go to meetings, I don't really want to you know, getting a business opportunity out of it. I just go because you want to hear new ideas and different points of view. Even if you disagree, it's just sometimes like, well, that guy thought that, what a mentor. But you like, at least you knew someone, someone thought it. So yeah, it was, uh, I don't think I like that part. I, I've, I, I came off all social media actually um, nearly a year ago, apart from a LinkedIn. So yeah, every, everything was gone. I just, it's not really my, it's not, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't find uh, the base understanding of why it exists for that connectivity is, is awesome. But what people do with that connectivity is not. Yeah. Uh, well, um, that's true. And I miss networking. I'm using every opportunity to, to, to talk, to get inspired by others. And I actually can do it even at our office with Dominika, who's <laughs> behind the camera, <laughs> just, just over there. And, you know, it, it's, it's uh, at least we can talk with each other and, you know, just bump our ideas of uh, each other. Uh, but on the other hand, social media like LinkedIn gives me the opportunity to be like um, like a joker in cards. Like I can just write to really strange people and ask them what I'm interested about. Like I'm, if I'm curious about space, I'm writing to ESA and if or to someone at NASA. And uh, well, sometimes they are writing me back and they just answering my questions. And it's like, wow, it was impossible before 2020. So fair enough, fair enough. No, no, if you found a, a utilization for it, it must be much better. I, um, I, I didn't, sadly. So yeah, I didn't. But your idea sounds much better than mine. Wow. Okay, so uh, I, uh, I, uh, I wanted to start um, our official interview <laughs> uh, from asking you how, how, like about your education process. Because while I was uh, checking your profile on LinkedIn, I found out like you were studying a lot, and like you even studied theology. And how have, how have you come from theology to technology? Because, you know, it's basically uh, what you're doing now besides education, but it's based on technology. So it's like, it's not very obvious connection, theology, technology, education. So what happened? Yeah. I, think, um, I think for me, I've always studied what I'm interested in. And what I mean by studied, I mean my own study. Like I will, I'm um, a devourer of things. So if I get into something for six months, that's me. I'm in there. And actually all of the masters and the qualifications, the psychology, English education, it says, and the masters, all of them were just done after I'd done my own reading and interest. So I'd be really into something and then I'd be hammering into that. And then I was like, well, I know so much now. I may as well get a qualification out of it. So my learning was always pre the actual course and then uh, because you can know something and then you need to see how it bashes against um, what, what you're going to do. So when I became really interested in the digital technology, um, I know there's some of the certificates are behind me, but if you see this one here, that's actually a, sorry, that one is a PGCE and that's the one you need to be a teacher, right? That's the one. You, now I was a teacher in 2006. I was a head teacher in 2013. I took a school to the highest accolade it could get in 2014. Um, and it continued. And then in 2018, I did my teacher training uh, just to show you, because then I was really interested and obsessed with teacher training. So that's when I was really focusing on that. Um, because the, if, I think if you go into, uh, and I'll say this to the, all the model world, and especially if there's any young people watching, if you are going to a university level course to go and get your education, I think you've got it the wrong way around. Uh, you go and do the university course to get your qualification. So obviously my degree, and I love my degree. Don't get me wrong. I loved university. I loved it all, this and the other. And I did psychology. And it was brilliant. But all the masters I did since, it was literally just a case of, all right, I've done that. Now I'm interested in this. And then I kind of put a full stop on it. 
with the qualification or the masters. I wasn't really interested in the knowledge of the masters. It just kind of swelled and augmented around what I knew. And then I got to meet other people. But remember the last, um, the last, uh, I think one's 2006, one's 2012, one's 2015, one's 2018, um, of all my postgraduate qualification. But all of that is simply in a situation where, um, all of that is simply in a situation where the, uh, it was just supporting what I was interested in. So even now, like when, if I think about doing something, if I'm really enjoying something, I'd be like, oh, maybe I should do another master's in it, or maybe I should do a diploma in it, or maybe this, that, and the other, just to get the punctuation. So that's how the philosophy one came about. It was just, I was really interested in the ideas of theology at the time. So when, after I'd done all my reading and became interested, I went and did one in theology. But it, I never, I know, you know, I'm not a, a great student. I won't sit there and be like every day, this, that, and the other. I'll just do what I need to do to get the qualification because I know I've already done my learning. <laughs> So well, that's that's a very interesting uh, point of view of uh, of education process and um, how um, how does it relate to your company to guide education? Are you is it based on this kind of process? The, the well, it's really interesting. So when we talk about education, uh, a lot of people have kind of fixed ideas. What we know generally when we're talking about education, we're going to have a bit of learning, a bit of qualifications, and then this kind of nebulous term of education. Um, and I try and split them. So when we actually talk about guide education, what we're really talking about is learning for different scenarios. So obviously you've got the base idea of what learning is, and then you've got learning for context or learning for applicability. And so what we really try and do in the first instance is provide a tool that gives you the best supported chance of having a staged learning setup. This is what really works if you want to learn for a certain scenario. Um, but our first our first port of call was really trying to make more teachers because as you, as you probably know, there's, I don't know what it's like in Poland, forgive me, but there's a massive shortage of teachers around the world, huge shortage of teachers in England. And the UN predicts it's going to be 68 million teachers short by, um, by 2030, 68 million. So when you think about that, that is a huge problem. And um, really guide isn't really set up about education guide set up about opportunity because uh, as, as you know, talent is abundant. You know, especially with the work that you, you, you and your colleagues do, talent is everywhere. But the problem is opportunity for that talent is not. And so we believe or we know from the research that create, uh, creating more opportunity for people with talent, I, we believe will make a better world. So we know that the, the, the quality of a school, the quality of the education in an area can actually improve housing prices, it improves and lowers you know, drug use, it in, lowers alcohol abuse. It actually improves societies if people have better teachers and better schools and therefore better students and more opportunity. Uh, and that's the kind of thing a school can be the center of an upward spiral for everyone in an area. Whereas um, again, a school could be a complete negative, a bin, a sewer uh, for an area. So we try to get more. And the only thing that really matters is the learner, obviously, but the quality of the teacher. A school is nothing without the quality teachers. So you, you need quality teachers, and that's what we try and help the world make more of in, in I think it's 15 different countries now. Okay, so can you, can you tell me how, how does it work exactly? You have a situation in place where you have um, the lecture being delivered and then maybe the seminar, and then they go into school. And then the problem is there's a big disconnect between what they learn, not in terms of content, but in terms of day-to-day -day applicability. And there's not a real mentoring loop. So really, if it was ideal, the people who are delivering this should be able to see how you're putting it into practice and feed back on it. But that doesn't happen. But that's what our system allows now. A learner can learn something, have seminar discussion with people in the same conversation, and then have what we call asynchronous feedback. So you record yourself in that situation and then your mentor is able to pinpoint on the video, your actual video, at the exact points where you try and apply this. Think about that. You did well there. And so it creates a much, much better um, learning loop for the learner because there's learning for knowledge, but then there's learning for applicability. And um, what's fascinating in, in what we've been looking at is how teachers see themselves and how teachers see lessons because the difference between a novice teacher and expert teacher isn't just what they know and what they can do it's how they read the room and eye tracking software that's been put into different classes or put into people watching different classes just shows you a novice isn't 
bad at what they're doing. They literally don't see what an expert sees. And so what we're thinking of now is how you speed that up. So as you see from what I've said, it kind of, what ours does is it draws together four or five different items together to put them in a swirl that helps the, um, the learner develop faster. But the key thing in it is video. If you ask someone to reflect on themselves in video, as actors have known for years, if you ask someone, they will naturally improve. They, they know or they can see what they're doing wrong. And a lot of the things that a teacher may do, be doing or not doing is habitual. And so when they start to kind of change their habits to be more uniform teaching habits, they perform better in classrooms. And then when they perform better in classrooms, they can develop better relationships. When they develop better relationships, they can pass on the information more. And then they're dealing with the learner at a slightly higher level than that they were dealing with originally. Because remember, all in, in a lot of the kind of studies and research we look at, um, the teacher only makes a 30% difference. So in class, like the colleagues around, the, the students and the culture in class makes a massive difference to learning as well. So really, we're just trying to get people in a way they can be super reflective on their teaching, et cetera. And that's what our technology kind of helps and does in the first instance. Okay, so uh, you mentioned technology, your technology. And uh, so what, what, that, what technology does in, in this process? You you've mentioned video, but what else? Yeah, so essentially the process, if you, if you were going to try and solve a teacher training problem, there's probably five things you'd do. Number one, you'd have brilliant videos. Okay. Number two, you'd have a way of scaling it. Number three, you'd have a way of mentoring properly. Number four, you'd have a way of turning it into any language with, uh, with any face. And then number five, you'd give the internet. We can do the first four. Right. So the technology process that we have are uniquely based to actually create nudges to push people along to get people to adapt and learn a little more. So we do that from the first instance when we set something up with the school. We say to the head teacher, hey, if you make a video like this, it's going to do this. Hey, if you put these questions in on these videos, it's going to do this. So the technology in the first instance is a massive nudge machine but it scales the best of face-to-face -face engagement. I'm not saying it just scales a video. It scales the nuances that you'd expect to have in a learning process, which a lot of other systems don't. A lot of other systems, which have their place, obviously, um, they really focus on just getting question, answer, question, answer. So that base level of retrieval, which, um, you know, often is forgotten very, very quick. But that's actually one of the things about online learning. It's, it was never made for learning. It was made for compliance. So the history of online, imagine if you're starting with that as a background, it's like, well, what's the best way to learn? That wasn't the question. What's the way we can cover our asses in court? And that is how online learning was made, which is why it really caters to just one form of learning, but it's not applicable learning. And then the, the second half of our technology is probably more what people would understand by, because the first area of technology we have is subtle, but the second range is um, deep fakes. So we could, I could take this video of you and I could have you speaking Spanish, have you speaking anything in any language. And we've made that so we can take um, content that head teachers want to share with the school community. So one, one school we work with, 40% of their um, children in their school here in the east of the UK is Polish. And so a lot of the parents didn't speak very good English. So what the head teachers wanted to do is they wanted to put themselves speaking the newsletter in polish to polish parents and so we trialed this and it went down phenomenally well and that's the other thing about people will learn more from people they relate to and i actually have a theory obviously i don't have the means to test it but i believe that if you were to put a um the same level of kind of intelligence experience etc etc teacher in front of people that look like them people will just naturally learn a bit better because some of the stereotypes and biases we have you know we just go from the teacher and also just some of the people will just see a relatability there because sometimes there's a real disconnect with education so i'll give you a good example we're, we're doing it at the moment with a school group in india where the an, a premier league indian cricket player is offering their likeness to speak our teacher training content so we're taking our teacher training content putting it onto an asian likeness or a near asian no sorry a near asian again according just to, to a eurocentric view um likeness of a celebrity in india and it's all going to be in hindi or Gujarat, or the language that they need and he's going to look like he's training teachers there and, and remember that we're using that borrowed authority the borrowed authority of him being you know sports people especially cricket are like gods in india so they're they're 
it's just it's just you know it's much better than just a video of this translated with a subtitle and so that's the second part and with that we really feel like we're we're really onto something um because you're breaking down a barrier and that's what i was talking about in those four stages that's the fourth stage where you're actually making it very very approachable very very um um relatable just really relatable it, it's it's better to hear things in your own language and rather than just to have a very eurocentric um kind of uh, hegemony on knowledge do you know what i mean a lot of people especially if you travel around the world you find that everything kind of comes from oh it's british oh it's from harvard oh it's this oh it's that and it kind of dilutes the learning culture of that place and to our detriment in the west we don't get the nuggets and the knowledge that is available because maybe English is such a ubiquitous language for social media, for everything now. And, you know, there's, there's credit in that, but there's also a problem that we don't really get to absorb what's coming out. So if we can do it the reverse, which is what we're planning to do, well, what's the best of this method? What's the best of that method and how we can use it to just kind of add to our flavor. There's nothing conclusive in education. There's nothing conclusive. There's the, the only thing that we know is good is feedback, but you know, that was how all original schools and learning was. Do you know what I mean? You didn't have, sorry, learning was, it wasn't, uh, apology, I misspoke with schools. You would basically have, if you could afford it, a mentor who walked around with you and taught you all the subjects. And you had that loop, that whole loop. And, and that, that's one of the key things we're trying to go, go back to because a lot of the kind of things that you hear about get debunked over time. So they're like, oh, this is a great new one. It's not, it was rubbish. Oh, this was a, oh no, it's rubbish. So even when you start to see um, different countries' uh, reputations fall apart, or why they're not you know, celebrating one thing and not the other. I think it's really important because we get into fads and um, you, it, it, teaching is an individualist breath. Do you know what I mean? There's as many ways to teach a person as there are you know, ways to breathe. Like it's so, so different and layered. And um, the second part then of the technology, what does the mission allow is, and this is what we really, really believe, um, everyone should have, every adult should have teaching skills because at some point they're going to interact with young people, whether that's a young person coming into their workplace, whether it's a young person at their church joining for, for something, whether that's obviously in a school, but almost obviously in parenting. So how, if you think that you have to have a driving license to drive a car and then you actually get to have a baby and there's no obligatory knowledge bank of development that you, that's a bit mad. Do you, when you, when you're like, Oh yeah. And everyone's like, well, you pay for it yourself. You find out the journey and I just think that if we make this knowledge available to everyone, the situation, space and place then is for our generation to just always be an opportunity to make things better for the next generation. And I think that will really, again, create lots and lots of opportunity. Yeah, well, you just answered like uh, my other three questions I, I had in mind. <laughs> but uh, well, uh, yeah, I, of course, I agree with you totally. Uh, I even um, I was listening to uh, one audiobook. Uh, it was science fiction. Um, and it was about, you know, uh, far future. And there was this um, species that had uh, uh, like dedicated group of society dedicated to education like uh, parents uh, bi biological parents weren't expected to educate to um, develop children because they had they ha they haven't got enough skills to do it so there were in this society there were specific group of people who could do it like it was it well that was crazy uh, unless uh, uh, and then i i've heard you talking about it so <laughs> yeah well it, it, it's so right because if you if you sit with enough parents and obviously I've worked in lots of different schools and fortunate enough to work. And then really you just sometimes, especially in the, with the, some of the more difficult cases, you'd be sitting there just thinking, damn, I need to teach the parent because the parent would come in and the parent always difficult, always had the same thing. They come in and the first 15, 20 minutes, they fight for their child's right. Whatever the child's done, right. They fight and you just have to get through it. And you don't ever argue that point because like all human interaction, what you say at the beginning isn't really what you want to say. You have to wait. You have to let the layers peel back. You could almost look at them as therapy sessions at the time with parents. And then the second one, they start to argue with the child, right? You get to a point where you just show them things in a certain way and then they argue with the child. And then the third part, they actually reveal things about the relationship, about themselves, about their own childhood. And then you literally, they leave the room after an hour, and then, or more, sometimes three hours, and then you'd always be thinking, oh, I wish I could help you too. 
but um, the the element there where the parents can be a huge hindrance for their children and a huge help. And one of the things is because parents don't know they the amount of parents that said to me in my life, well, they won't be good at school because I wasn't good at school. And then you just have to be like, well, that's not how the brain works. That doesn't take into regard any neuroplasticity. That doesn't take into account any of the opportunity that's available now. But why would they think anything different? And then remember, you give the child back and the child's only been with you for six, seven hours. And for the next 18, 19 hours of the day, or sorry, 18, 17 hours of the day, they're with a person that has limiting beliefs. So if you can make the parent have exploratory and growing beliefs, you you just create an opportunity. I'm not saying you create anyone smart, but only when you've taken the horse to the water, it's then got its choice to drink or not, but you, the society has done its part. And like I said to you, if we, if we do do that, we'll just have a much better, I mean, look at, look at China, for example. I mean, that's a, that's just a key thing. Now let's, I'm not talking about the, obviously having lived there, I'm not talking necessarily about the education system, whatever else, but, they were doing X, Y, Z in world rankings and economy and this, that, and the other. And I think it's about 18 years ago or 20 years ago. Sorry, obviously after COVID, you don't actually remember what year you're in anymore. Um, they decided that they were going to up the national spend on education from 0.5% of the GDP to 4%. To 4%. And a lot of people within China, they actually credit the huge improvement in the last two decades on China based on that based on creating opportunity for everyone, based on creating avenues for everyone. Because when you do that, you create all the avenues for entrepreneurship, drive, opportunity, etc. Now, I'm not saying that that's a, a conclusively good model, but I am saying that you can link a lot of the improvements in that society with the education reforms. Now, some of the negative aspects you might want to talk about, would they have also led or been aligned to education reform? Not really my... My, you know, not really my interest. I, I'm, but Chinese people have told me categorically we have improved because 20 years ago we made a decision and that decision was to actually completely overhaul how much we were, excuse me, spending on education. So I, I think you, you take the good where, where it is. Obviously, having lived in China, I loved it. So, but I didn't have a Chinese person's experience. So I won't, I won't comment on that. Yeah, well, but um, you've mentioned China and they've made uh, this um, this huge decision 20 years ago and it was a central decision. And do you believe this, uh, like companies like yours can uh, make such a difference as well? Uh, or do you believe it has to be this kind of central decision in the country? No, you look, look around. I mean, look at new banks like Revolut or Wise that are changing all of banking. The, the, the convention is trying to catch up. Look at Facebook and the rest is trying to catch up. And you've got to argue whether we have a quick enough power to hold what we don't want to happen. So online racism, for example, is really big in the UK at the moment. A lot of people talking about it. Lack of mental health support, really, really big. And they're highlighted by social media. But can the government change fast enough? No, because government has to be government. And so that's the point of companies like us. We have to bring in new ideas. And ultimately, they become the popular ideas. Because remember, school or the NHS uh, or mass schooling or the NHS that was just someone's idea. That wasn't a government initiative. That was someone's idea. They put that kind of into, uh, generally from Christian um, charities, etc. they would start creating these schools, they would start creating these hospitals, and they'd be in a situation, and then the government caught onto it. But in, in some cases, the government wouldn't even wanted something like that. They, you've, so there's, there's too many layers. So yeah, it's really on companies to start pushing and setting, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work, because the government can't be seen to fail repeatedly. And obviously, as you know, probably one in a hundred startups you know, can even survive. What is it like? Seventy percent of startups fail within a year. And then, you know, stats like this, blah 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 blah. And so, so it has to come from private companies. But we, the the, the status quo or the position that a government etc. has to hold, it has to be unifying across the board. Remember, a government isn't there for what's best. A government is there to get the best of the averages right it's not there to be the best at education or the best in it it's not that's not its job its government is to make money move to make the average supportable for all that's how it should be um so it's not there to give you educa- excellence in anything like no government in any country is there to give you excellence in anything that's not a criticism that's just a an impossibility how how are you going to do that just look at amazon reviews like just to see how wide-ranging people can be on anything but the key thing for companies like us and what we do is being in a situation where we do the testing the scaling and the cost cutting if your product doesn't ultimately save people 
uh, or improve people something on a ratio of three times, forget it. So if you make me a slightly better textbook, forget it. If you make me a digital textbook, forget it. It's got to have a benefit times of three for it to be transferred or adopted by someone. And what we can do is prove it. So again, just because just it's got a good technological base on this. Um, 2009, I made a YouTube channel. This is how I got into video. And I got into it because I was just bored of repeating myself in class. And so instead of doing extra sessions, I did loads of video sessions. And then these videos just took off. And so by 2012, we had three different channels, English, maths, and science, millions of hits on all of them for English, maths, and science, right? And so you're just like, wow. Now YouTube then obviously turned into a beast and a behemoth. I went a private route. And now people say, you know, I learn as much from YouTube as I do from there. And now you see, once that's been tested, proven, shown, the government in England spent 4.8 million on a brilliant initiative called the Oak National Academy, where the English math science you had was quite vague. And then what they did is they actually got a load of teachers together, government supported to make a national online curriculum for the entire country. So until that changes in the next three, four years, England, England, uh, forgive me, I don't know if it includes Scotland or Wales, going to use it that much. England now has the educational basis for all of the subjects at all of the levels for everyone. That is unparalleled. Now, the government, if you just gone and told the government, hey, let's spend five million pounds on a bunch of online lessons, no way. But when you can go look at YouTube, look at um, Tuition Kit, look at Khan Academy, look at, and they see all these private endeavors doing it, they can go, we have reason to be. Do, do you see what I mean? So a government, a government should follow best practice, but a government can rarely lead on the best practice because there's too much risk. Do you, do you know what I mean? Um, I could go into that forever, actually, so I'm going to stop there. But I, I, hope that makes, I hope that makes some sense. How do you cope with so many different cultures? Like we, even with these uh, governmental decisions, uh, it's so different in China than in UK. Uh, it's, uh, I agree with uh, you when you say uh, government is not to do brilliant, excellent things. But in China, they actually can assume they can like they decide we want our country to be that or that and uh we we made we make these central decisions and force everybody to comply and uh, so that's one uh that's uh, that's only one uh, example you know of differences between these cultures these countries how do you cope with it well, that, that's really interesting because the, um, the ultimate part of where, you know, the small business owner in any economy is a big part of any economy. But in England, the government is reactive because of the democratic nature of everything else. And so it has the position to, like I say, watch, see what's best and go. China, and I say this with, with all love and respect, there isn't really a private company. Right. Because ultimately it's very different. So what I was talking about there, where you really have private companies and you really have the government state, they're not intertwined. That's not the case in China. So a lot of the biggest um, companies in China are government backed, government supported, government initiated, government controlled, government this and the other. And you see that no more than with Chinese airlines, right? If you basically speak to a Chinese airline person, you are basically speaking to someone who works for the government, right? And that's across the board. Nothing happens in China without that. And China has done that for speed. China has done that to actually make up for the, di the difference. You remember with China as well, I mean, one of the most amazing things about, about China is it's never had a kind of conquestual background. It's never really looked to go to war with other people. It's never this, that, the other. It's always kind of had its internal issues and factions and really unifying China is all China cares about, especially with the amount of people. They have a very different goal as well. They don't say to you, and, and, and it's two very different cultures. They don't say to you, we have philosophical ideas like we do in the West. We need democracy and free speech and your rights. They don't do that. What they say in China is everyone has to be fed. Everyone has to have the opportunity of a house. And so that's the kind of key mantras, you know, like to think it feeds 1.5 billion people a day. That's the greatest pride for, for the Chinese people. So it's a very different thing, especially after centuries and centuries. Of so where that comes down to kind of the application of technology to goals, you could probably say like they're in the stage of the industrial revolution. We were 150, 200 years ago, and then they might get to an age of enlightenment as well on top of their philosophy, this and the other. But, but, but it, it, it's not this, you're not talking about the same thing just because they both have governments doesn't mean they apply in the same way at all. So everything I was saying earlier really applies to how a British government is, or again, in our related Western context. But for China, China's like everyone has to get on the same page. Everyone has to get on the same page. And actually looking at what they do and how they build and how they grow, that's the thing that's most important to them. Key in that as well is they have 
um, th they can think in, um, in a very different way. So a government here, as soon as they've won, like and formed a government, they have to basically start electioneering again. China never has to do that. So China can think in stages. So they have what they call missions. And these are basically, okay, mission one, we do this, mission two. And these are like five to 20 year plans, right? For different missions. So I think currently they're in the 12th, before Corona anyway, they're in the 12th mission. And so they set five, 20, 30 year plans. Like just that kind of idea of government. And then the whole country looking at that and going, well, well, the world's going that way. What entrepreneurial endeavor can I kind of fit in and kind of mask in? And that's why we were quite hot in China at the time because the 12th mission includes um, the exportation of Chinese education. Um, but you see how different that is. It's not necessarily, oh, the culture's just different, etc. It's just what sets the tone is different. Our government is so self-interested in keeping power, then the companies have to do what they're doing. Whereas in China, it's just like there's only one way. So everyone tries to align to the way rather than, you see, it's a completely different kind of way of approaching it. So China's way of doing it, and obviously for China with us, um, it's more about English language than teacher training because it's illegal. Well, not illegal, but, well, it's banned, so I don't know what, what it is, but we're not allowed to train teachers in Chinese schools. We're not allowed to. So what we do is we focus on English, which we are, are allowed to do because we train English. And then in private schools who want foreign qualifications, we are allowed to work there. In um, language centers where you're teaching English language, so you might have a different way of teaching the English language, we're allowed there. But we're not allowed in Chinese schools um, because, again, of their homogenous culture, their mission, their spread, etc. So you couldn't even look at... So it, it, everything's different. Like in... In China, if you're good, there's no top set or bad set. It's like, I don't know, it's still the case everywhere, but it's like, well, if you're the best child, you sit at the front of the class. If you're not, you sit at the back, within the class. Uh, a, a teacher in China can become a qualified teacher having never, ever taught a child anything. They sit an exam, and when they pass the exam, now you're a teacher. So it is so fundamentally different to how we are and operate and the goals of society are so different it's impossible to compare the two um now obviously I'm, I'm a foreigner in both countries right i was born here but obviously i've been treated sadly as a foreigner all my life i love i love britain and obviously in china i love china obviously a foreigner there and that's actually one of the nice things about china is it doesn't matter where you're from if you're white um, um uh, middle eastern asian black you're foreign. It doesn't, there's no differentiation. You're just a foreigner, which is amazing. Whereas here, I mean, one of the things about moving to where I moved to here is there's more racism towards Eastern Europeans than there is towards people of ethnic minority color. And you're just like, that's mind blowing for me. Do you know what I mean? Having suffered racism in lots of different places. And so you're just watching this change, even in what racism is. And within China, there's none of that. It's just, you're foreign, have a nice time. We're in control. And then here, obviously, everything swirls and messes. And I think there's there's beauty in the there's beauty in the simplicity of the Chinese system. I'm not I'm not commenting on everything else that goes with that, but um, yeah, it's very it's incomparable systems. And then and then the ironic thing, and this is the this is the I would like to say this because I think this is one of the deepest problems is if we're in a situation then where we're saying our governments are reactive, and then some national score testing system, the PISA results come up. And then suddenly our fragmented inward looking government is then trying to challenge on math scores, pure math scores, somewhere like China, where it's all just one line, one focus, one this. And we're not taking into accountability our creativity, our ingenuity, our, our lateral thinking. And we're then comparing and we want to try and make kids in schools match maths tests to this culture when this whole culture is set up to give you a very different result. But if there were creativity tests and ingenuity tests and da 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 da, da it wouldn't, do you know what I mean? We would, we would absolutely kill. But, and I think that's one of the problems as well is trying to have international rankings, tables and systems. It's not the schools you're talking about. It's not the governments. You're talking about culture. And essentially all that international tests do in schools is compare cultures. You're not comparing any educational outcome. I promise you, if you took those kids and taught them that way, even if they were Finnish kids, British kids, American kids, Polish kids, they would do as well as Chinese if you put them in Chinese culture, 100%. So it's all a bit of a fraud. 
actually it's a it's quite different point of view about education what what you're telling me and it's very interesting it fills a lot of gaps uh, especially when i'm thinking about online education and um yeah well, it's it's different approach um i i wasn't for example about china i wasn't uh, um, i i was never th- thinking about China in this way, about China education. I was always thinking about China as a monolith that, uh, you know, it's it's a little bit oppressive and I couldn't, uh, you know, uh, uh, stop thinking in my way about China. I was always comparing it to my uh, ways of thinking, like what about freedom? What about, you know, philosophy and uh, creativity, like you said? Key little point in that, remember for, for, remember how Chinese people have been seen and perceived, you know, there's the docile, quiet, everything. That, that, that hasn't left them. Do you know what I mean? Japan, Japan got to them, the British got to them, the French got to them, the Americans got to them. That is a long, long history. And it's one of the oldest cultures in the world. You know, we can track Chinese writing down like 6,000 years, right? It's a long, long time. And they've never tried to go out to cause anything but entrepreneurship, you know? And so you can't imagine that not being in the psyche. Do you know what I mean? There's a, the, the, you, the, if you turn around in, in England and you want to say uh, something, you want to whip up something nationalistic, it's quite easy because Britain used to run the world and it used to this and, you know, one third of the world, the, the sun never sets on the British Empire. But if you were to go somewhere like Finland, Finland's always had, you know, wonderful autonomy and the space that it's in and protection and this and that, obviously apart from obviously the World War II and, and the rest. But um, it's always had a very different scale. Imagine if you were part of a country that has just been continually tried to be ravaged by other people, um, what would your psychology be? So would you care much for a country trying to tell you democracy, democracy is like, hang on a second, you came over here and you did what? Or when our people came to you, you did what? It, do you see what I mean? It's just, we take one point and then we paint it with everything. It's like, that's not how it works. But just my opinion, just my opinion. I agree, I agree. But it's good to, to know another point of view. And uh, I, I don't know many people from China, so I can't compare notes with them uh, by myself. So, yeah, well, but... Um, I wanted to ask you if uh, last year, I mean 2020, um, changed something in your company, uh, in the ways you were working or just how, how it was for you? Yeah, in terms of how we were working, we were lucky from when I set up, um, obviously I was a head teacher when I set this up, so I, I couldn't have people in offices, so I had just remote people the whole time. So we've never, ha- we have registered offices, we have an office, we have a training center, we have a lovely training center actually, but um, we've never worked together. So we had, at one point we had 80 staff, now we've got 42, um, but we've always worked remotely. We've never worked together. So we've always had that. I wouldn't know how to work in an office with someone. So it's the exact opposite for us. Everyone just came onto what we do. And so we were like, you know, with friends and they're like, Leon, how'd you do this? How'd you do that? And one of the biggest things is like, dude, you just have to trust. You just have to trust. Right. And then you're not asking for what time they did something. You're not asking for the specifics. You're not asking them to explain it to you first. This is more than ever. You need people who can actually just work under their own initiative. You have the goal, you have the space. And then you're trying to be like, what's the output? And that's been the biggest shift because a lot of management and leading isn't really management and leading. It was kind of watching, do you know what I mean? And then it's kind of like, how oh, your time? And it, it was horrible. And I could never work under that. That's why I was in teaching is because of the autonomy. And also as a writer, when I used to do TV episodes and write TV shows and that, again, it's the same. It's like, look, there's your deadline. We'll see you in a few months. But like, yeah, great. That works for me. Um, but obviously you have to have a reason and a way to, to organize yourself. But um, yeah, we were, f- we, it's not even, nothing changed. All that changed for us is our business went through the roof. So, so previously I'd be going to schools and be like, hey, there's a, and I'd be like, oh, sounds good. That oh, sounds interesting. And then afterwards, literally the same head teacher would be like, oh, I wish I'd known about this before. And we're like, yeah, we, we did tell you. But people can only see things. That's a good thing about learning. People can only see things once they have a need. They can't see things before they know there's a need. Do you know what I mean? If it's a sunny day and I explain to you a light switch, you're like, okay, great. Do you know what I mean? If you've never seen a light switch before, but when it's pitch black and I explain a light switch, oh, okay. Do you see what I mean? Anyway, yeah. Okay. So last question is, um, um, how do you see the role of education in um, inclusion? In, I mean, uh, inclusion excluded groups of people. I, I, I know it's 
kind of obvious and I, uh, I know how I see it, uh, but uh, do you have some specific thoughts about uh, inclusion of these this groups of people who are disabled, um, older, or just don't have money to, to use education? Well, yeah, the, the net result of what I'll say is a completely different outlook, but the starting point is the same. A lot of curriculums and development plans are kind of based on what we want you to learn. And what it misses out is one of the core things, what we call readiness for learning. So the readiness for learning being your physical state, your mental state, your attitude, your desire, your this, that, and the other, and the basic knowledge you need to have to access something. So the British government did a, a course, um, I think it was 2007, eight or nine, and they gave every teacher the opportunity to do a free master's. Free master's. Uh, guess what the completion rate was? I don't know, 15%, 30%? Two. <laughs> Two. Um, so it paid for all these people to do masters and they signed up on courses, the university got paid, et cetera, et cetera. But these people weren't ready for learning, right? In those different ways. So you've got really smart people who are perfectly aligned in why you need this and they didn't complete. So one of the things with actually helping and working with disadvantaged groups and um, people who are kind of less able to access is you have to start from learner first access, right? And learner first basis. When you do that, you know, for one group of society, that's going to mean you're going to need um, to do special educational needs items around first. And one of them means you're going to need to train teachers in a different way. In one day, it's going to mean you have to set up the classroom in a different way. In some people, actually, it means you have to work with the parents and work with the communities and the families in a different way uh, to protect people from different things. And then all of you would converge into a space where you start. But the content is the content is the content. You do not need to change the content in the first instance you need to change the delivery and the understanding of the teacher because remember what we try and think of is learner and knowledge and we just take the learner and we want to fill them with knowledge it just doesn't work like that every step of conduit is a step of conduit almost like a like a tube if you remember london like a tube line like there's loads of junctions you have to get through and there's loads of ways it has to work back and the most exciting thing i think coming now is that what we'll have learned is that the teacher in a classroom for too long has been a regurgitator of knowledge or information. And with the advent of this ubiquitous Zoom learning, video learning, YouTube learning, what you really can do wholeheartedly now is have all the information at the Oak Academy, all the information is nationally available. And the teacher can then expect the child to do or follow or know or we've done that with the parent with this and they can just work on the teaching how to actually take that learner-centered approach. If the teacher doesn't have to just get through the content anymore, and they can actually take the time to work the content into um, just personalizing and exciting and a referential, you know, link into their context, everything will change. But at the moment, they have to just burn through content. So once that changes, all the disadvantaged groups will have teachers who are more ready to actually apply things to them. But the biggest overall change you could have is if you had a, because what is the point of taking a child who's been through four foster homes and abused and this, that, and the other, what's the point of sitting them in a maths lesson? What's the point? You have to get them ready for learning. And it takes four to six weeks to really build trust, build relationships, get their core skills. Because a lot of the kids I've ever found who would do really quote unquote badly academically, um, once you have a relationship with them, they have the skill and then they have the desire. Yeah? You've just got to give them a reason. And whether that reason is your future, education in itself, please the teacher, keep your um, head high amongst your friends, the reason will come. And, that, and that, that's it. So going to a real learner readiness approach as opposed to learner information absorption for a test once a year approach, it just makes no sense. When you, when you break it down and you realize the technology that's available to you, so why, why, aren't, why aren't more exams like, why, why can you have the exams every month? Why not? There's no logistical nightmare. You can do them all online. So why, why wouldn't you do that? Why put the pressure on the kids, everything towards one point in the Why? Why have everyone in the same class just because they live near each other? That doesn't make any sense. See, do you see what I mean? There's things that worked for the law of averages back, you know, and the last... You know, the last five years, seven years in particular, we're like, yeah, we need to rethink this. And so what our, our system is based on that, whichever way you wanted to rethink it, we can support the nudges and the technology along the way. But um, look, all, all I can say, 860 schools use our stuff now um, around the world. Um, 
I, I would I would hope that you know with the end by the time we get to the 2030 it'll be a million schools around the world um, you've got to start somewhere so we'll try and um, the beautiful part about it is me and the team I said this is a very collective view if we fail it doesn't matter because we may just just like when I did the YouTube channels and then 10 years later I got to see it's a national thing the same idea if we were just part of the use case to prove it I have no problem because ultimately, if someone can take the baton on and then be in a situation where they can do this, it would be amazing. So it would actually, it would take me two days to take, if I had it, the English curriculum and make it available in Polish on, on your face or a Polish person's face, someone they can relate to. And it would take me about two, three days. And I could have the entire knowledge of Western teaching, the, the, the highlights, available in your host language for every parent in your country. You know, that, that's it. Now, there's people that will definitely do the deep fakes better than us. There's people that will argue about what the content we're sharing is, blah, blah, blah. That's fine. As long as you've made the vessel, you've actually done what, what the belief was. You have taken opportunity to create, sorry, taking the time to create more opportunity for the talent in your space. And remember, like, who cares more, really, than a parent when they're in their right mind? Do you know what I mean? Who cares more about that? And that's, that's, that's the part we're trying to really plug and support. <sighs> Uh, thank you, uh, <laughs> but I feel like uh, I feel like uh, I, I I I have some other questions, but I won't ask them now. But you gave me uh, something to think about, and uh, I hope I can write you uh, in the future. If We always you'll see like if you send me something, I'll respond. I don't write emails anymore. I, I make mini videos and I send them back, so it's easy oh, for me. I cool. never write. So cool. I because think that, even if you think the tone in an email is so hard to get right. Do you know how many times you try and correct what you do? I don't do that. I just record a video like, hey, I'm annoyed at this, but look, it's going to be fine. But if you write that in email, it just feels like, oh, oh. <laughs> okay, I have to try it. Uh, I'll, I'll try to try it. But uh, so thank you. Thank you again. It was, Hello, thank it was. You, thank you for having me. I really, really appreciate it. I'm sorry for, sorry for going off on tangents at different points as well. You have to forgive me, uh, Martina. Sorry. That was great, actually. And um, I love the way our conversation went around. So uh, thank you again. And I hope we'll be in touch. And if you, if you will have any questions or desire to talk about Poland, Polish, or uh, anything, just let me know. <laughs> but then, but then uh, like, I, like I said to your colleague the other day, I said, like, look, if we can find me a Polish teacher, we can start doing this. So if you know any Polish teachers, people who are interested in it, I would love to 